Hello. I'm excited to be here again. Let's pray. Holy and loving God, please let the things that I say, the things that we think, and what we take away from this be holy and pleasing to you. Please do good through this message. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So our scripture for today is from the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, it is Matthew 5, 38 through 48. So up to this point in Matthew, Jesus has been baptized. Jesus has faced temptation. Jesus has called the first disciples. And now he goes to the mountain to sit down and teach them. And this is what he says. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The word of God for the people of God. So imagine with me, waking up before the dawn, you didn't sleep well the night before, the bed was too hard and too small, not to mention it's summer, and we all know what that's like. You stumble out, get the children ready for the day, get yourself ready, you spend the whole morning on your feet, rushing around, hectic, trying to get together before going off to a hard, labor-intensive job, maybe in farming, maybe in construction, by midday, you're sweating. Your feet, which you've already been on for the whole day, are hurt. Finally, you get a chance to take a break, to rest under a cool tree as the breeze picks up. You can close your eyes and enjoy this one moment of rest. Then, you hear the sound of a 60-pound pack slamming into the ground next to you, kicking up dust. Looking up, you see an armored soldier towering over you, hand casually resting on a sword as he orders you to pick up the pack and carry it for him for the next mile. After your rough night, after the hectic morning, after the back-breaking, foot-aching day, you have to stop what you're doing and carry the 60-pound backpack of a soldier of an occupying enemy army because it's the law, a law you had no hand in creating and have no ability to change. This is the situation faced by the Jews in Jesus' day. Centuries before Christ, God delivered the people out of Egypt, like we sang about earlier, and into the promised land, only for centuries after that, for them to be conquered and brought into exile. The temple, where God's presence touched earth, was destroyed. They were forced from their homes and forced to serve an empire in a faraway land, and eventually, the descendants of those exiles were allowed to return on a long journey home to a place they'd only heard stories about. And after this conquered by yet another empire, only for them to successfully revolt and win their freedom, only for Rome to come in and take control again. By Jesus' time, the Roman Empire was tightening its grip on Israel, even creating laws that residents have to stop what they're doing to carry the soldiers' packs for them. Imagine with me again that after lugging this pack a mile in the heat, Receiving no thanks, you return to work and labor through the rest of the day. You hear your fellow workers mention rumors of a local miracle worker, a wise teacher, who will be in town the next day. Maybe you could go hear what he has to say. Maybe he has something to say to help the situation, or at least do something about your aching feet. And on the way to see him, you see signs of the empire. You see the tax office, where what little you have is taken away. You see the garrison where the army has set up shop. You see the courthouse where Romans can literally get away with murder. 
But when you finally get to this teacher, you get to sit down off your aching feet and hear what he has to say. He says, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also a second mile. Love your enemy. No, I don't want to speak for (laughs) y'all, but after that day that we've just imagined, I think that just might be the very last thing I want to hear Jesus say. Today, we are fortunate to not live in that empire. The closest we get to empires is stories like Star Wars, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, Marvel, take your pick. Stories of heroic rebellions, overthrowing all sorts of evil empires. Even if it's not a story of overthrowing an empire, we glory in good revenge stories. I will admit, I really like Carrie Underwood's Before He Cheats. It's a great song. Today, we're fortunate to not face the oppression of the Roman Empire. We're fortunate to not carry 60-pound packs for miles in the heat. But we have our own issues. It's not true that America is more divided today than it has ever been. But we are deeply divided. And about important issues, many of which, though not all, have well-meaning people on either side. Instead of turning and seeing the empire, we're at risk of seeing enemies in our neighbors wherever we look. I think most of the time, seeing enemies and those we disagree with comes from a good place in us. We passionately want to make the world a better place, both to honor those who came before us and on behalf of those who are coming after us. But when we try to fix our messes, there are other people looking us in the eye, saying we're wrong, we don't understand the real problem, or worse, that we are the problem. To use a lighthearted example, I'm seeing articles from millennials complaining about that dang Gen Z ruining things, just like they complained about was happening to them. Of course, these generational issues are the least of the challenges we face. We don't see Rome, but we do see enemies everywhere. And part of the problem with this problem is we can't even agree on what all the problems are. And if we do, we can't agree on which solution to take to address them. We have to follow our conscience. We have to do what we think is right, but that means we can end up opposing each other on opposite sides, believing our neighbors are our enemies. We need to try to do what's right, even when our enemies oppose us, maybe most especially then. And whenever there is a true, genuine enemy, Where there is evil, we are called as Christians to oppose it. Confirmation service was only a few weeks ago where our confirmands took the vows and we remembered them, the first two of which are to renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of the world and repent of our sin, and to accept the freedom and power God gives us to resist evil, injustice, and oppression. We can't be bystanders when we see evil, and this means if we're doing our jobs, if we stand out in the world, if we're salty, We will face real genuine opposition. We will face real enemies, not just well-meaning people we disagree with. So we pray and we ask, how do we overcome this evil? How do we get out of this mess? And as Jesus said so many years ago, says to us now, go the extra mile, love your enemies. Don't think Jesus has seen our movies because we're supposed to beat the bad guys. I don't think Jesus gets it. I do wonder where he gets it, where he gets this radical idea, and it is a radical idea. One of those Jews in Jesus' day, watching the Roman Empire take control, was a young mother who saw the puppet Roman king murder babies in a village out of fear and go unpunished for it. The young mother and her family were forced to flee the country to go into exile in a faraway land, away from their friends, their family, their support, until that king had passed away. And only then could Mary, Joseph, and the young Jesus return to their home. Mary saw the Romans coming in, taking power, oppressing the Jews at every turn. Mary saw the Romans allow Herod to get away with murder. Mary watched hate and anger growing in her neighbors. What makes us the people we are? When we walk, who taught us to walk? When we speak, 
who taught us to speak, the words to say, when we love, who first taught us to love? Jesus, as we know, is fully human and fully God, and so Jesus' words come from God, but they also come from Mary, his mother, who taught him to walk, taught him to talk, taught him to love. Mary raised Jesus through the terrible twos. She helped him take his first wobbly steps. She heard his first words or attempt at words. She measured his growth marks as he grew on the walls of their home. She helped wash his teenage acne. Come to think of it, she probably even washed our Lord's hiney. And most importantly, she taught him to love as God taught her to love through her scriptures. Mary had seen the oppression of the empire firsthand, and the little boy she was raising, she taught to love his enemies. And Jesus, in turn, on this mountain many years ago, and in this text today, sits down to teach us the law he learned from his mother, but fulfilled in a new way. Not only are we to love our neighbor, we're to love our enemy, not because we're supposed to suffer needlessly at their hands, but because loving our enemy is precisely how we overcome this evil. It is the answer to our questions. Overcoming evil comes through love, not in a violent rebellion, although those make great stories. We overcome evil with the love of Christ, the love Christ teaches us, the love Christ has for us, and the love Christ gives us to share the world. Now, I do want to be clear about something. Jesus' advice in these first few verses of if someone strikes you to turn the other cheek, if someone sues you to give them everything you have, this is hyperbole. Jesus does not want you to get hit again if someone hits you. God does not literally want you to sell all the clothes off your back so you have no shelter. After all, a few verses before this, Jesus talks about if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. And obviously, we don't do that. <laughs> this is hyperbole. But it's hyperbole to make a point, and a strong point. Jesus is saying, if we're going to be children of God, if we're going to be true children of God, we need to love our enemies because that's what God does, who makes the sun shine on the righteous and the unrighteous, who sends rain for things to grow to both. So when Jesus says, turn the other cheek, he's teaching us how to love our enemies. He doesn't leave us stranded wondering what to do. We do not love our enemies only by praying for them, as Jesus says, though we do that as well. We love our enemies when we choose intentionally to actively do good acts for them, even when they are actively doing evil to us. This isn't an empty point either. This isn't some teacher sitting down in a lecture and going home and not thinking about it again. Jesus lives this, even to the end of his life. At the end, he and his mother watch the Romans force another man to carry a heavy load, Jesus' cross, where he is about to be crucified. When the empire crucified Christ, he did not fight back. He did not lead a violent rebellion against the evil empire, the kind we so love in our stories. He loved them so much, he gave up his life, so that one day even his enemies might too be saved and know the love that brought him there. Loving our enemies is in this way at the heart of our salvation and the salvation Jesus offers. God's great victory at the cross and resurrection came out of love, even love for enemies. This kind of love, I don't think, is something that comes naturally to us. Um, I think it is something that we have to learn. It's something that we are taught. Like Jesus, this love is taught to us by the people God puts in our lives. Like Mary and Jesus, the mothers in our lives, biological or otherwise, everyone who loves like a mother, who has that love, teaches us to love like God loves them. Through them, God gives us the kind of love we need to love even our enemies, those who do actual evil. Every hug we've gotten from a mother, from someone who's been a mother to us, every loving look, every kind word, every bandaged knee scrape, every time we shared a meal over our favorite food, every moment where we sat, sad and overwhelmed, when all we needed was their loving presence and arm around us. 
every act of love given to us by the mothers in our lives, they did for us what Jesus does for us in this passage. The love we have already, the radical love of God that we offer the world, does not belong to us. It's not something we created. It is God's love taught and given to us by all those who have been mothers for us. It has been grown and nurtured in us by those mothers, whoever they are for you. They taught us this love that comes from God to transform the world. And we honor them by following their example, thanking them, passing on this love, continuing the tradition of Jesus and Mary by teaching this to future generations. We practice love for enemies. To the people looking for a path to victory over the empire, Jesus gives them this answer. Love your enemies. Not just a warm, fuzzy feeling. Action, intention. To the people facing evil in our modern world, to us looking at division, Jesus gives us this answer. Love our enemies actively. These are not empty words. This is how the world has changed. I think it's tempting to think of this in a cute uh, way that isn't necessarily wrong, but where one small act of kindness inspires another, where if I hold the door for you, you hold the door for someone else, and it continues on and on. I think that's good, but I think this kind of love is far more profound. Like a child imitating their mother's love, when we love our enemies, we're true children of God. When we do good to our enemies, we're loving like God, and when we love with that love, love taught to us by God, love given to us by God, we bring God to the world. In those moments, when we do something good to those who hurt us, when we love our enemies, we bring heaven to earth with God, even for a moment. And in that moment, the world is transformed because heaven and earth touch. Eventually, some of the Jews began a rebellion Things bubbled up, and they resisted, and they lost. The temple was destroyed, and many were sent into exile again. But today, that empire has not been around for centuries. But we're here. Jews are in their synagogues. And every week, we gather to hear the words of the law, to hear the words of Christ, Every week, we gather together to learn how to love. Every week, we go from here with God so the world may be transformed by that love. Centuries from now, like the empire, our enemies and our evils will not be here, at least in the same form. But Christians will. God will. And they will still be learning and teaching the world to love our enemies, to overcome evil with love, to help bring heaven to earth. Let's be part of that legacy and that future this week and thank those mothers in our lives who taught us this love. Amen.